Hey guys, if you stuck with us from our first video, this is the second video. Uh, this is going to be an explanation of low on route and high on route charts in Navigraph for Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020. To start, I just want to say that I'm in no way affiliated with Navigraph or Microsoft, either as an employee or sponsor. Um, I do, however, enjoy their products. So again, this is the second video in a series that will walk you through from a basic understanding of what Navigraph is. That was our first video to an explanation of low and high charts. That's this video. And then we'll move on to procedures and plates and how to use them to fly an IFR plan on route. Please have a look in the description for a full list of all the videos in this series. As I add new videos, I will update the descriptions for each of the videos to include that full list. This video series is by no means a complete and comprehensive description or use of charts or plates and is designed for flight simulation enthusiasts to get a primer on using and interpreting chart data as presented in Navigraph. This video and the information in Navigraph should not be used by pilots or those training to be pilots. There, that's my disclaimer. In our previous video, again, we looked at Navigraph as a product and how to use it for basic functions and why it's important to up your game when simulating flying in, in Flight Sim 2020 or any simulation product like X-Plane or B3D. In this video, we're going to explain the information presented on both high and low en route charts and how to use this information to navigate. To begin, let's start by explaining what these charts are and the difference between high and low en route IFR charts and VFR sectionals, which we are not going to discuss in this series. We will add to this series when VFR sectionals become available for Navigraph based apparently on FS2020 mapping data. I'm told that this is coming soon, so that should be an exciting addition to Navigraph for those looking to plan or fly VFR flights, um, especially on a second monitor. I think that would be great. So, unlike VFR sectionals used for visual flight rules, when weather is permitting, and usually on shorter routes, IFR maps do not display topography features. No contour lines, obstruction heights, roads, or cities. And things like that depicted because you wouldn't be able to reference these anyways, as you are not navigating visually, but instead using navids within instrument flight rules, or IFR. On route and low and high altitude charts provide aeronautical information for instrument navigation in the low and high airway structure of certain airspace. The primary purpose of on route charts is to depict radio navigation data to provide rapid and precise location and identification of information requisite to radio instrument navigation. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, let's get into some information that you're going to use. First of all, high and low charts refer to high and low altitudes. For instance, the IFR en route high altitude charts are designed for navigation. These ones here, above 18,000 feet to 45,000 feet mean sea level, which, or MSL they, they say, which is the level above which altitude is measured by a pressure altimeter setting like 29.9 or 2, which refers to the inches of mercury setting of your altimeter. I know you've heard ATC read those back to you to let you know that that's the, the amount of inches of mercury to set your altimeter for to get an accurate reading. IFR or instrument flight rules en route low altitude charts are designed for navigation below 18,000 feet or flight level 180 down to mean sea level. Note this is different than AGL or above ground level. You may be at 15,000 feet above sea level but only 10,000 feet above ground level if the airport is 5,000 feet mean sea level. These charts always refer to your planned altitude above sea level. If your route is planned with a cruising altitude of 18,000 feet or flight level 180 or above, you would plan your flight with high charts. Likewise, if you're doing a shorter route or have an aircraft not capable of cruising altitudes of 18,000 feet, you would use low altitude charts. With that out of the way, let's take a look at some of the information provided to us on these charts. First, let's have a look at airways. On our up here low en route chart, we will find a few different types of airways, most commonly Victor Airways, designated by a V followed by a route number. These airways are based on VOR or Vortac Naves, which we will discuss a little later, and they are always black and may or may not have DMEs used for distance measuring uh, associated with them or at their station. If 
we click on a Victor Airway, we can see some information about this airway displayed at bottom right. The distance between two intersections. Also, this is displayed, if you notice, right above the Victor Airway, 57 and 57 nautical miles. So it's displayed on the map so that you don't need to click it. We also see a minimum altitude of 3,000 feet. This is also displayed right on the map for us here at 3,000 feet. And we will discuss this in a little bit. And if we click on it like we have, we see that it fixes here's to MXE. And at one end, we're going to have MXE and the other end we're going to have here. So it tells us the airway connects two nav aids and this tells us which nav aids they connect. Victor Airways usually have a width of about eight nautical miles or four nautical miles either side of the center line. So for all of you riding your uh, GPS uh, magenta line as if ATC is going to call you out if you uh, stray one or two feet left or right don't worry, you got a few miles. We also see on our low altitude charts T routes or Tango Airways. These are right here. And these are low altitude RNAV only routes and require a certified panel GPS installed into your aircraft to navigate. All of the glass panel aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, like the Garmin G1000 and G3000, are so equipped. Similarly, Distance and minimum altitude information is displayed above and below these Tango routes. Of course, it also tells you that it fixes to BABS and to HAR. If we take a look at our high unroute maps, we see different sets of airways, namely Juliet and Quebec, or jet and high altitude RNAV routes. Jet routes are essentially high altitude Victor airways. using VOR or Vortac nav aids, and Quebec routes are the equivalent to Tango Airways on our low altitude charts using RNAV or certified GPS equipment to navigate. What is the difference between these GPS routes in high and low charts and the other types of routes, namely Victor and Juliet routes? One is based purely on GPS or navigational equipment installed into the aircraft, which works regardless of altitude or terrain, while the others rely on ground-based equipment that your aircraft receives a signal from. This ground-based equipment has limitations and needs line of sight while at distance or to be within 22 nautical miles and the published minimum altitudes to work correctly. In general, you will find the distances between navies much larger in high on route charts than in low. There are a number of other types of airways not discussed here like brown airways that designate military routes or TK helicopter routes and more. For the most part, you will be using the described routes to navigate from point to point. If you see this gray circle here, along with Boyd Burlington 245 UKL and the Morse code underneath, when I was learning about flight from the ground up, some of you may get that reference, we had to learn to navigate using NDBs or non-directional beacons and although fun, I doubt any modern pilot misses them and I'm told does not even have to learn them anymore. Many NDBs are in disrepair and I believe no longer maintained as a system. So the nav aid that every trainee pilot loves to hate uh, will not be discussed any further than the fact that they exist on this map as these gray circles. Not. You'll also quickly notice that airports have different colors. The green airports are VFR only and have no terminal charts, no Jeppesen approach is published, and usually no airport information or any other uh, charts for that matter. Only airport information like GPS coordinates, elevation, and runway information are available with any airport that is in green. You can see that information, of course, by clicking the green gear and running through the information through the three tabs here. Blue airports, however, like shown here, have terminal charts and approaches published by Jeppesen, meaning they have an approved instrument approach procedure and or radar minima published. IFR airports in blue and VFR in green. You can see those published charts by clicking the airport in blue and clicking the pink icon here. It'll bring up all the charts on the left.
airport information on the map, as you see here, Toronto, Lester B. Pearson International, CYYZ 569-111. This information is as follows. Toronto is the airport location name. Lester B. Pearson International, which is sometimes similar to the airport location name, is the actual airport name. CYYZ is the ICAO identifier. 569 gives you the airport's elevation, in this case 569 feet, and 111 is the longest runway available at this airport, which is designated by 11,100 feet. It's much like flight levels, it's uh, 111 represents 11,100 feet. We can of course confirm that information by clicking the airport here and seeing that the elevation for Pearson is 569 feet and the longest runway is 11,100 feet or 3,383 meters. So all of the airports published in here should have that information here to give you its identifier and its elevation above mean sea level and the longest runway available in this case, Orangeville Rose Hill, the longest runway is a mere 1,600 feet. Many times there are multiple pieces of information provided under one area of the map which may make it difficult to select the appropriate nav aid, airport, or airway. Like you see here, there's an NDB, an airport, and a VOR station, and many other things that are all within a small enough range that I can't click them with my mouse. If we right click, however, any area of the map, we get a drop down box that allows us to see everything within a five nautical, five nautical mile range of where we clicked. So in this case, we have Toronto Oshawa Executive Airport, so we can just click them in here. We also have a DME, uh, distance measuring equipment, so there is no VOR there, just a DME. And we also have an NDB, which uh, probably, well, the further north you go, the more likely they are to still be using them. We also have a, an airway, A21, and then you get into some airspace regions. You have the Toronto Oshawa ground, and you can see here that they control from low to ground to upper limit of, uh, uh, sorry, so they control from ground to 3,000 feet, and they are on the low on route maps and you can start clicking out to some pretty big regions. And we'll talk about this later. This is the Toronto FIR. And you can see the region that they control is quite large. But that was all received anywhere on the map. You can right click and see many things including the, well there's the upper region airspace. This region, the last one we clicked, is our largest division of airspace, the Toronto FIR or Flight Information Region. And this is the largest regular division of airspace in use today. These regions become useful for you for receiving flight information or alerting services and direction from ATC controllers as you're flying from point to point. Uh, if you're going across the country, for instance, you may go through a few of these. Note you will see both FIR and UIRs, UIRs being the upper information region for an area that usually covers 18,000 feet to 60,000 feet. If there is only one FIR for a given area, they usually control all the airspace, including the upper regions. As you can see here, this is FIR slash UIR. So Toronto FIR controls the whole region from the ground all the way up to 60,000 feet. Clicking on different areas of the map as you fly through them. And you can select, in this case, here we have Cleveland FIR and UIR, so they control different altitudes of airspace. But if we click on the Cleveland UIR, it just gives you some information here that they control uh, the lower limit from 18,000 feet to flight level 600, which is 60,000 feet, and can be communicated with on these frequencies. They will usually, usually you'll be handed off to one of these frequencies, but if for whatever reason you were flying through and needed that information, you could get that from this chart and contact them on one of those frequencies. An open triangle, like we have here, just denotes an intersection but with modern GPS systems is now also considered a waypoint. If that triangle is filled in and completely black, it means that this is a mandatory reporting point. All of these triangles here, you can pass 
you don't need to pass completely over them. Uh, if you were conducting a turn, for instance, from Victor 36 to Victor 501 at Horn, uh, you could cut that uh, pretty far away. You, like I said, you have that four nautical mile width here that you can you can cut around that without any problem. If that was filled in black, you would actually have to pass over that waypoint um, as it is mandatory reporting. Just a note. The information in Navigraph and on Jeppesen charts is a bit different than what may be provided to you if you download the FAA or Transport Canada's charts and plates. In particular with Navigraph, there are fewer altitude-related and distance-related information than you may be used to if you've been using real charts for any amount of time. Next, we're going to take a look at two of the types of altitude information provided by Navigraph. The first is the grid mora, or minimum off-route altitudes, also called ORACA uh, on an FAA chart and other charts, or off-route obstacle clearing altitude. You can see this here uh, with this 6059587910.5. As you can see on this screen, I hope it, the resolution's not too bad. You see these green grid blocks created by a one degree by one degree longitude and latitude. Each block has a two or three digit number at its center. These numbers are the minimum off-road altitudes published by Jeppesen for that grid. Altitudes below 10,000 feet are green, and those above or three digit numbers are always maroon. Grid moras provide pilots with information while flying off any of the airways that you see here. So if you're flying along these published airways, you would follow something different, but if you decide to fly off on your own and through any of these grids, these numbers here are your best friend. Grid moras provide pilots with information while flying off any of the areas within that grid that they can clear any obstacles by at least 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet in mountainous terrain. Route mochas, or minimum obstruction clearance altitude, provide pilots with a minimum obstruction clearance of anything within the airway you are traveling with a 10 nautical wide width sorry, along that airway. Again, a thousand foot minimum clearance or 2,000 feet in or around mountains. And the route mochas are right below the Victor Airway 306 in this case. So right below all the airways, we saw those altitudes earlier. Uh, and when you click them, you can bring up those minimum altitudes here. Those are similar to these Mora uh, off-route altitudes, except for these say that if you stay within that route, Victor 306 with uh, a minimum of four nautical miles on either side, you are safe at an altitude of 7,000 feet, giving you a thousand foot clearance or 2,000 feet in mountainous terrains. So these uh, um, minimum altitudes while flying along airways and off route, you're looking at these large numbers in the middle of the grid. So these altitudes along the Victor Airways in this case also ensure an acceptable, acceptable sorry, navigational clearance altitude to pick up signals for the next nav aid as flying too low may prevent the nav aid signal from reaching your receiver. So how do we determine if we are in a mountainous area or not? It's simple. All more altitudes which are 6,000 feet or lower have an obstacle clearance of at least 1,000 feet. And if the Mora altitudes are 7,000 feet or greater, like they are in these mountainous regions of Western Canada, then the obstacle clearance is 2,000 feet. While grid Moras created in the 40s became less important as civil aviation became safer, they were originally used for pilots with engine failures to determine glide paths with unreliable NDB navigation and such. In fact, the history is quite fascinating. But Ironically enough, they've now become more important than ever because GPS and FMS navigation allowing direct routes flying off airways means that this more information created and provided by Jeppesen is the only minimum altitude information available for pilots. So if you decided to go from one airport and fly a direct route to an airport close by, the only indication you'd have of your minimum altitude uh, would be these uh, more indications. Now, that being said, that 
that's a little bit different with these G1000 and G3000 with their uh, terrain following features and things. But again, it's something you would still want to pay attention to. Now let's take a look at nav aids. There are essentially two forms of nav aids that we'll be looking at here. And although nav aids can come in many forms, they will most likely fall into either some form of VOR or GPS category. VORs stand for VHF Omnidirectional Radio. Note VOR slash DME are VOR stations that provide additional distance measuring equipment to allow you to know your exact distance to or from that station. You'll also come across VORTAC or VOR slash TACAN stations, which for our purposes are the same as VOR slash DME stations, the difference being that they are dual-purpose beacons that house a VOR and TACAN system for military aircraft. The distance measuring equipment used by TACANs is the same for civil aircraft, so can be used as a VOR slash DME station. VORs are pretty easy to find on the charts. The compass rose is a dead giveaway. The little mark at the top of the compass rose in black in the top left here, we can see one a little bit better. In this case, it's, it's black filled in with gray. This denotes magnetic north. You can see airways coming and going from the VOR stations with their appropriate headings. If you were flying away from or flying into Zilla, you would be flying at 260 degrees into or moving away from Zilla at 260 degrees outbound heading. The important information at any VOR station is the little gray box that will jet out from the VOR beacon. Sometimes that gray box is farther away on the maps with a gray arrow that points to which VOR station that it denotes. In that box, you will find the name of the station and its frequency and designator if your equipment allows. This designator will pop up on your screen to show that you are tuned to that VOR. You also have the Morse code below that if you have your audio tuned into that frequency, you can hear the Morse code designator of that station on your headset. The other type of major nav aids that are important to our plannings are our nav waypoints, which are the stars, and intersections, which are the triangles. These systems are the easiest system to use if your aircraft is equipped with a certified panel GPS, as many are in Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, two examples being the G1000 and the G3000 found in many of the GA or general aviation aircraft. Of course, all the airliners and heavies have some sort of system that also supports our nav and GPS navigation. Any one of these nav aids can be found on either the low on route charts or high charts or both. In this case, this waypoint is found on both. And I found a waypoint in here that you can see level low. It is only found on the low on route chart. So if you were planning high on route chart for your flight path, you would not have trags as a selection or you would not be able to intersect with TRAGS without changing your uh, altitude. We briefly looked at flight information regions and upper information regions while going through the right click option. You can clearly see here all these green lines and these are the boundaries of these regions with the appropriate center that controls them written along the edge. So if we come in here and select one uh, actually, we'll right click because that selected a smaller region and we'll do the Salt Lake City FIR and we'll zoom in and you can see right along the border of Salt Lake City is Winnipeg FIR and that green outline all around the map sort of gives you an idea of who's in charge of those regions. Now I briefly mentioned NDBs or non-directional beacons um, prior saying that I wouldn't talk about them. Uh, it's outside the scope of this video, but I will mention this. If you're in for a challenge and you want to learn about NDBs, there's lots of information on the internet. Uh, and if there's enough interest, maybe I'll make a video on navigating uh, towards NDBs. Uh, that's about as best as you're gonna get towards them. And uh, if you're up for a challenge, 
try to navigate using only NDBs uh, across a province or state or, or across the country like the US Postal Service used to do. And again, these are uh, the NDBs here and um, this is how you would tune into them and confirm that you're on the right NDB. But I'll leave it at that and maybe if there's enough interest I will create a challenge topic uh, for another video. You will also find purple outlined areas on the map which you should be concerned with when you see. Usually these are military or other areas are warning airspace areas that may contain activity that is hazardous uh, to non-participating aircraft. So maybe training exercises or um, usually military related, but there could be other reasons. Uh, if you click these areas here, you'll see, for instance, this Isabella is military and it's on the low on route chart from 200 feet to 18,000 feet. Now there might also be a um, military designation for this area on the high on route chart so you'd have to check that. Uh, if we come over here you'll see things warning areas so they're not necessarily military but either way they're letting you know that um, th there's something that could be detrimental to yourself or aircraft if you enter those areas. Lastly just out of interest there are some very large FIRs or flight information regions like Oakland Oceanic. Again, as a note for those more familiar with the FAA or Transport Canada's uh, standard aviation charts, a lot of things are not included on the Navigraph charts like minimum reception altitudes, uh, MAAs, MCAs, a uh, number of other things like crossing points or total distance from VOR to VOR. You usually see a little number within a box. Um, there, there's a lot of that missing. Now, does that affect um, the charts at all to use for simulation? Not, not at all. In fact, I think by design Navigraph has excluded a bunch of information that would not be useful to people using it within the sim. Uh, that being said, how the charts are used and the information they provide are accurate as far as real charts go. They've just decided to provide less of it. A lot of the times along these routes you'll see three or more altitudes listed with asterisks that are telling you uh, uh, other information that I'm guessing just isn't useful in flight sim. Uh, I'm betting that the distance and line of sight of the VOR um, frequency beacons, they're probably not modeled in flight sim, so if there's a mountain in the way, maybe you'll still receive it. Uh, I'm not sure. It would be interesting actually to test it. And, you know, how far away you get from that beacon, um, it should slowly, you should be, be not able to receive from it eventually, which is why you would have crossover points usually on this routes that at a certain point it would tell you to stop doing an outbound um, on what's this uh, Wilmington uh, or sorry on DuPont and start doing an inbound reading on the next VOR station. Uh, uh, I don't even know what that is. There's too much information there. I think Gribble is that uh, waypoint. But anyways, um, I noticed those things aren't here. I'm guessing in Flight Sim it isn't modeled. Um, potentially, and I, I wouldn't mind testing this, you can probably pick up both VORs outbound and inbound as you fly across uh, this Victor Airway. But it would be interesting to find out, and that's why I think Navigraph hasn't included some of this information. Now, as Flight Sim gets better and better, or as X-Plane adds some of these features maybe, um, I'm guessing that Navigraph will include more and more information. But that's pretty much an explanation of everything on these charts. I guess probably the only thing I missed are these holding patterns right here. Uh, but we'll probably get into those when we do the departure and arrival plates. Like anything else, you can right click anything here and we can click this holding pattern bunts and get some information about it. And that's it guys. Um, remember the biggest benefit of using Navigraph charts over real aeronautical charts is that the Navigraph charts um, information can sync with Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 to provide identical information in both your charting software and sim. So if either of those is out of sync, you're going to get very frustrated with planning in one and it doesn't match the other and then, uh, you know, basically one or the other tool is useless. In our next video, we will have a look at some of the chart types and plates available in Navigraph. 
and we will go through an explanation of those charts and SIDS and stars and everything else in future videos. If you like this series and you want me to continue these videos, please like the video and subscribe if you'd like to navigate back to my channel to see our future videos. That's the best way. Thanks for sticking with me and I hope you enjoyed. Fly safe.